got the thing to start. Move. Go ahead. I bid you welcome to this act of worship as we celebrate the life of our brother Hatton Callender. Those of you who are new to this place, we bid you a special welcome as you join us this evening. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. We brought nothing into this world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our opening hymn to God be the glory.
Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Strengthen this faith and hope in us all our days, that we may live as those who believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we have a set of tributes by Richard Allen, Wayne Ford, and Beverly Callender. They say that every moment a star is born. And on the 26th of May, 1957, Patton, a destined calendar, was born to Mumsy and Daddy Calendar. The sixth of eight children. Hutton was a very special person. He is a person who put everything into everything that he did. And he was described as a scholar, a gentleman, a sportsman, a Christian believer, and an everlasting child of God. We are told of when he went to sit his 11 plus paper. And at that time, you would come out for lunch. And this was, we sat at Harrison College. I passed for Harrison College the same time as, as, as Hatton as well. And his mother was there waiting when he came out to have his lunch. And she knew the lady who was selling the snacks and so at the canteen. And she introduced her, him to Hatton, her to Hatton. And after the exam, he, he said, Mumsy, the lunch was so good that I went in and mashed up that paper. He never forgot I own. And every time he came back home from overseas, he would inquire about her. Hatton and I shared many things together, same primary school, 4-H club, AYPA. In fact, I, I'd share one with you there. I understand Hatton and his family lived a little bit further from the school of where than I did. So I always would be tended to get to school early. Now, we went to primary, primary school just above there, and we had one headmaster, now deceased, I wouldn't call his name, but his nickname was Bruiser. His nickname was Bruiser. And we are told that Hatton, Lynette, and Gail would actually run from home to get there. And some people would say, well, that it was Hatton's own um, quest for punctuality and so. But there was a very good practical reason for it as well. Because Pine Primary had two gates. The lower gate was, was one gate, and that was kept closed in the morning. The upper gate actually was like divided into a, a, a kind of a V. So you, had, you could go, it actually was a, a triangle, but you had to get past that point of the V to go there. And after the last bell rang, Bruiser would stand at the apex of that V. And when you got there, you had to run. You really had to sprint. He, I, I, he, I think he actually enjoyed it. You would run as fast as you could to get past that lash that would come down on you for sure. So I think that Hatton also had that incentive to, um, to get there early. 
And I remember um, there's, there's three of us that used to walk around a lot together as teenagers, myself, Hatton, and Grantley Green. I, 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 won't, um, I will not lower my, my mask, but what I can tell you is that Grantley was a charmer, a smooth talker. Hatton could no other way be described than as suave. And I guess I was used as bait because I had pretty eyes and a handsome face, which I wouldn't wait to show you. <laughs> and they, they took care of the spots that I attracted. <laughs> but we had some good times. And I wasn't quite as fast as Hatton as a runner. But I remember that at 4-H Club, I could actually nearly match him in speed. And we ran the three-legged race together, and because we were more or less the same height, and I nearly had as much speed as he, we actually sprinted the three-legged race and won it. You know, we have a very active college chat. And late last year, we realized that we were missing Hatton from the chat. And it was quite ominous because always he would be there to bring some measure of balance to our conversations. And then we learned of his passing. And this gathering here is the result of how we felt about Hatton. Now, Hatton's wife was not able to be here today, but she wrote a, 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 a poem to Hatton, which I think she would not mind. In fact, I think she would be glad if I shared it with you. She said, it is so difficult to let go of one you love. So many years of togetherness and sharing, from Afros to gray hair, and even stronger bond when we became kidney twins. You are my friend, soulmate, and husband. We, are so com we were so compatible and liked many of the same things, thought so much alike. It was scary. Thanks for our beautiful children, Rochelle and Nico, and for embracing my nephews, Greg and Paul, as our own. Thanks for bringing me into a calendar family filled with love and captivating my family's hearts. I will miss you singing to me and trying out your new karaoke tunes for me to critique before reaching the big stage. I will miss that true Gemini personality, beautiful smile, quick wit, dry sense of humor, and the way you cracked up as a good joke. It was tough to see you ailing. God saw you were weary and took you home. In true Cali style, you went to rest peacefully and quietly. It's with a heavy heart that, release, that I release you to God's care. Your earthly work is done, and so your heavenly work has just begun. I know you will be singing with the angels now. Sleep on, my darling, as you take your flight and become my guardian angel, watching over us all. Our lives will never be the same without you, but we will carry you in our hearts forever. Your loving wife, Beverly. I think Hatton would want me to say to you, do not mourn as those who have no hope. Death is an election, sure, but it's also a gateway to eternal life. And if sometime when you are asleep and there's a thunderstorm at night and you hear, how's that? Hatton has taught the angels the beauty of the game cricket.
Yeah, good evening all. It was the 5th of September, 1967, when a group of starry-eyed boys entered into those hallowed halls in Crampton Street. And we were put in different forms. I was in 1B, Hatton was in 1C. But we got together for PE on the first week under the tutelage of Colin Martindale. And what we were supposed to do is a cross country, a lap around the big field and one around Weymouth. I hadn't won and I came second and I made a little promise that that's the last time that Hatton would beat me in a race. Unfortunately for me, Hatton didn't read that script and I've never won a race against Hatton. But I feel a bit safe in the fact that there are a lot of people who have never ever won a race against Hatton. Hatton was a superb athlete. Um, to see Hatton running the 400 with his long strides was a joy to behold. And not only an athlete, he was also a very good footballer. As a matter of fact, footballer up to the point that he played first division football for Christchurch United, myself. He was also a member of a cup winning hockey team. And his first love, cricket. And as a cricketer, Hatun was par excellence. He just came around at the wrong time. He had a great knowledge of the game. He knew everything, he was a great captain, he knew everything about cricket. And even when he left and Hatton went to the United States, Hatton still maintained that verb for cricket. But all in all, Hatton was much more than a sportsman. I mean, we shared many days together. I remember um, being cut off, a group of us were harmlessly walking down Crampton Street when a white car, MG 110, I think it was, cut in front of us in Crampton, where we were going at 12.30. And after we assured him that we were not going about anything nefarious, he allowed us to go. We nearly were late for the um, 1.30 show at the Empire. <laughs> but we shared a lot of moments together. And whenever I had the opportunity to visit the United States, I will always make sure I visited Hatton. And from the time he was in Empire Boulevard in Brooklyn, and we always kept up. And then there was this kind of affinity that Hatton had towards my mother, and that my mother had towards Hatton, that she always used to think that Hatton is her brother or her second son. So much to the fact that when my mother passed in 2020, December 2020, I came back here and on the 13th of January 2021, I entered the funeral home. And there was a casket and a large bouquet of flowers. And I told my daughter, wow, the funeral home has really pulled out all these stops. That is a big bouquet. And as I got closer and I saw the card, the card wrote um, from Beverly and Hatton Calendar. And my eyes welled up. And I called Hatton the same time and he said, oh, no, it's the least I can do. And then on the 27th of December last year, in our robust chat, Hatton posted this tribute that I'll crave your indulgence to read. He wrote, good evening, gentlemen. I would like to pay a special tribute to Miss Joan Ford, Nova's mom, who died one year ago today. 
Your motherly love to so many still resonates within us, and you will never be forgotten. On behalf of all your boy children at college, continue to rest in peace. Hatton, you continue to rest in peace. Farewell, my brother. Farewell, my buddy. In the Ophi days. Thank you. In memory of my husband, Hatton, my partner, soulmate, friend, and wonderful dad. I want to start by saying thank you to the Harrison College, College Reunited Fraternity, of which Hatton was an active participant, for being instrumental in putting this wonderful memorial together on Hatton's behalf, and also working so closely with the Calendar family in Barbados to make it special. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Monrell Williams and the St. Barnabas Church family. Words cannot express all gratitude and thanks. It's truly touching to learn of the positive impact and influence that Hatton had on so many lives. Mention made of his gracious demeanor, so impressive that he was the epicenter of pride, dignity, high esteem, and godliness, but still very humble. Love is creating a dream meant for two and believing that dream will come true. From the very beginning, we believed in each other. We wanted the same things and we were willing to work for them. We loved and laughed and learned to compromise. We took whatever life gave us and we turned it into something good and positive. Our bond grew even stronger and more special when we became kidney twins. Through all the tough times, we leaned on each other and held strong to our faith in God. Thanks for the gift of our children, Rochelle and Nico, the blending of the Brown calendar families, the many friends you brought into our lives and the many great memories of the love of family we created. We miss you and we talk about you every day that smile, that laughter, the singing is ever present. It's so hard to let go of the one you love, but wherever a beautiful soul has been, there's a trail of beautiful memories left for us to treasure. You bring me out, you hear my soul. With you I'm real, I play no role. My talk is true. My thoughts are free. I found myself in you and me. Rest on in peace, my beloved. We release you to God's care to fulfill your heavenly work on high. We hold you in our hearts until we can hold you again in heaven. as we sing to him, God of mercy, God of grace.
persons can make short, <laughs> short and witty tributes. The operative words being short and witty. Good evening, my friends. Um, Hatton and I go way back, in fact, in 1972 when I went to Harrison College. He didn't know then, but he became my brother. And I contributed immensely to Hatton's development. His 400 running improved because of me. His 800 running improved because of me. His cricketing skills that Nogo spoke about improved because of me. His hockey skills improved because of me. Because whenever I saw him and he performed, I had so much pride in knowing there is my big brother doing well that I thought that that was me. But the one thing he didn't get from me is that Hatton had presence. And presence is not something that you can describe or you know what, you, you know what it is. You can't cultivate it. So whenever Hatton came into a room, he didn't have to say anything. He didn't have to say a lot. But you knew that Hatton was there. Hatton was a tremendous individual. He didn't get the presence from me. He got the other things I loaded to from me. So when I think of Hatton, my only regret about our association is that I never told him how much I loved him and thought of him as your brother. And it isn't too late, because those of us who believe that there is more to this life than what we live, and believe that what we do live after us know that in fact that he would hear my words even now. I know that I loved him as a brother. And one of the things that we do that regrettably is that we believe that when we get older, that there will be time for us to get together and spend more time together and stuff. And that didn't happen. But Hatton was a good friend, a brother, and I loved him. I loved him dearly. And our families are very close. My aunts are there. My cousin, Nausicaa, is there. Our families are very close because my uncle, their brother, was married to Beverly for many, many years. And in fact, that brought our families together. The witty part of what I was gonna say is that Beverly tricked my family because Beverly befriended all the girls. And therefore, Uncle had no choice but to become a calendar. We used to say to him, don't forget your bath mate. But our families were very, very close. We will always be close because of that association. I want to thank Beverly and the kids. I want to thank Beverly, my aunt. I want to thank the Canada family for bringing us closer together and making me part of their family. If there's one thing that Hatton didn't do, which I asked him to do, is that there was a member of his family, a female member of his family, that I cannot persuade him to put in a good word for me. But I'm not going to call her name. But he thought that one breath in the family was enough. <laughs> to the Kanda family, to all of you here, um, to John and the boys who arranged this gathering this afternoon to give us a time, those of us who are in Barbados, a time to grieve, a time to stand with pride and to sing with pride, to look at each other with pride and acknowledge that a good friend a good man has gone, and we will say gone too soon, but it's not for us to determine. But what we must do is just to continue the battle with the same pride, the same industry, the same good character that Hatton possessed. It is ours to continue. So I want to, I want to thank you, and I want to thank the calendars again 
for giving me this opportunity and for Dr. Monroe for not pulling the mic from me. Thank you. Good evening, one and all. Uh, my name is Roy Kinch, and I reside I know you're surprised, but <laughs> I do reside in New York, and I have been with Haddon when he first came, when his younger brother, Drix, told me when I visited Barbados at that time that his younger brother was coming up and that I should take care of him, show him the ropes. Well, I said at his funeral in New York that he actually showed me the ropes after he came because Hatton was a man among men, and he did some fantastic things in New York, kept a lot of people together. He made sure that whoever came to his home at that time was probably entertained, and I can't say enough for his wife, Beverly, and the family. And I'm so thrilled to be here this evening, and happened to be here in Barbados, when the Harrison College group put this together. Um, uh, Mark and, and the guys there contacted me and I couldn't help but being here, but be here. Um, Haddon was a very, very dear and very close friend of mine. Um, for 40 something, over 40 years, we've, we, we did the streets in New York together. Good things, lots of good things. And I will share the story with you that I shared with folks at, at the funeral. Um, we were in a club called Casablanca in New York at the time. Hatton, I saw him as a, as a leg spinner, and we wanted this leg spinner in our team. And Hatton decided that he wanted to go over to Empire Cricket Club, Empire in New York, because that team was the strongest team in New York and they were winning all the time. So I told Hatton, well, look, you know, that's good competition to play against, so stay here with me in, in Casablanca and let's build this team together. Haddon said, and I spoke with him, and we discussed it. Three hours I spoke with him, and I thought that I was winning the argument. And at the end of the argument, he says, well, I'm sorry, man, but um, I'm going to Empire. So I scratched my head, and I said, well, the next best thing is to talk to Beverly and see if, if the, the power of the lady could, get that, um, could sway him. Well, sure enough, that didn't happen either. And Adam went over to Empire. Well, a couple of years later, he was speaking with me and saying, well, why don't you come and join a good team? And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Go play against Empire, go play for Empire? No, 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 I'm not doing that. But Adam said, and then he was captain. So sure enough, he then convinced me to move and come over to them, and I just couldn't resist. I went over to Empire. I said, well, well, well. And we had wonderful years together. We won, won the championship many times, and I, some of the best years that I've had playing cricket in New York was playing with Empire as well. So I would say to all of you, if you didn't know Hatton, or if you didn't have a chance to know Hatton, it was an integral part of your life gone. He was just a fine gentleman and, uh, and a fun person to be around, very, very knowledgeable, and as far as the cricket was concerned, as I've heard, you folks said, because I had a first-hand experience of that. And, um, and just when we talked to a man, a family man, who always made sure that he took care of his family and was always there. And then that bond that he had at Beverly talked about with that kidney transplant, I can't say enough. Um, just, just a wonderful human being. So I'm pleased and I'm glad that I got to know him. I got to spend that time with him. I would certainly say that he was a friend of mine and I know that I was a friend to him and his family. And I say thanks to the college, college guys, and thanks to all of you for coming out, and thanks to you, Dr. Williams, um, for um, being a part of this, and uh, good evening. Thank you.
you may remain seated as the choir leads us in the Psalm number 121. We shall now have our first Bible reading. A reading from the Word of God, reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, reading from verse 1. Through three. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory, the word of the Lord. We shall now have a musical tribute by John Roy and Betty Payne.
absolute sense.
Bible reading. A reading from the Word of God, written in St. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is the word of the Lord. To him. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. And I promise you, Mr. Braffett, I will not be long, so you don't have to look at your watch. <laughs> don't worry about Mr. Braffett. Mr. Braffett is my friend. I can trouble him in church. 
And I always tell him when he comes to church that I always have the last word. You'll have gathered here this evening to celebrate what ought to be for us not a tragic occasion. But it must be seen by all of us as a tender moment and not a tragic moment. And we are here because we are given the assurance of this because it was Jesus who said, I am resurrection and I am the life. But added to that, there is the decisive word for us this evening. For he also goes on to say, those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. We shall never die, we are told, if we believe in Almighty God. And therefore, we have gathered here this evening to celebrate Hatton's life. We are here to celebrate eternal life as we look into the jaws of death and we say with all joy in our hearts, death, you have no dominion here. But at the same time, our sense of loss is not diminished. Our grief that we feel in Hatton's passing is very real. And therefore, as we gather together, what do we have to give us confidence? And I want to venture to suggest this evening that there are three things that we can hold on to. First of all, we have comfort. We have the comfort of family, and that is why God placed us to gather into family units so that we might bear one another's burdens. It is in the context of our families that we are better able to support one another through life's trials when we are closely knit to one another. And there is no tighter knitting than is to be found in family. There is no greater solace, no greater peace, no greater degree of comfort than we can find with those who love and care for us. Because you see, no matter the degree of difficulty, no matter the type of loss, it is the family who is there and always will be there through thick and thin to bear us up in difficult times. But we also have the comfort of friends. Because you see, sometimes in the midst of the crises of life, the temptation is always there to think that we are in this alone. But the reality is that whatever life might bring our way, we are never alone in this world. For as long as we have good friends to share our burdens, you and I will never stand alone. For God is right here in the life of our friends that reach out to us in our times of difficulty. But ultimately, this evening, we have the comfort of Almighty God. The psalmist wrote words, though now some 3,000 years old, but words that are no less wise and no less comforting for us today. The psalmist wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. It is God, my friends, who is beside us now. It is God who is here with us this evening to comfort and to strengthen us. And ultimately, in the final analysis, God is all that we need in our times of crises. But not only do we have comfort, but more than anything else, as you would have heard this evening, we have memories. If we think of our lives as a pebble, a pebble that is tossed in the pond of life, the ripples grow ever wider, affecting the entire pond, and that is how we ought to recognize ourselves as living as human beings. For one human being's life touches another. Indeed, Hatton's life touched and affected 
every person's life in this room in many and varying ways. And I am convinced that this can be said of any one of us. Hatton, as you would have heard from his friends, both here and overseas, has left us with many lasting memories. He was a man who loved and a man who cared for his friends and family alike, and the memories have all been pleasant, and the memories are lasting. Those whose lives he touched were shaped by that experience. As my colleague, the preacher in New York, said, Hatton was a good man. And his refrain was, a good man uh, is hard to find. The men in here will not agree with that. Because we all think we are good men. Haddon was a quiet man. Haddon was a man of great character. My experiences of Haddon were confined to some very brief periods of his life. As we would encounter each other at social occasions in New York, are in Boston. I do not have many stories of Hatton. I met Hatton through his brother, Juni, or Drake's as we call him. And if you ever hear about chalk and cheese, Drake's and Hatton, nothing alike. But Drake's is my good friend. <laughs> my good friend. So I don't know all the stories. But it seems to me that there were many happy moments that Hatton shared with most of us. And I'm glad to have met him and I'm honored to have been numbered among those he called his friends during this time. I know that he and Beverly deeply loved and cared for each other, love which was made manifest by her action in sharing an organ with him. So we are helped because we have comfort. We are helped because we have memories, but supremely more so we are helped because we have hope. Note that in the 23rd Psalm, the psalmist wrote, through the valley of the shadow of death, not in the valley of the shadow of death. Essentially, he is saying to us that God does not abandon us when we find ourselves in times of crisis. No is our example here. You may recall after 40 days and 40 nights of storms, that Noah received a dove into the ark with an olive branch in his mouth, and that dove brought Noah what he could not see and what he could not experience. And Noah and faith took it to mean there was life, that somewhere out there there was land. So too, you and I have hope, because God in Christ has gone before us, and we shall one day follow and we are told that somewhere up there, there is a place for us, a place to go, a place which we are told has been made ready for us. And even though the world would say when they see us today that what we are doing here is morning death, we want to say to them that what we are doing here this evening is celebrating life, life in a new dimension. And we do not know what that life is like, but Hatton does. For Hatton has gone on before us, and he can now say what life in all its fullness is all about. Hatton grew up in this church. It was in this place that he had his introduction to the Christian faith, and where he would have learned what it means to be a child of God. He would have learned about that Christian hope and he was known to this God who loved and cared for him and who would have walked with him through the crises he experienced in life. Hatton was never alone. God was with him. And this same God has taken him to himself, not as a stranger, but as a friend. As my old grandmother would say, Hatton is all right today. And I know you don't understand that. But my grandmother would always say to me, when I say, Ma, how you doing? She would say, boy. I know I would say, Ma, you all right? She would say, boy, all right, people dead. And I have learned that in my life. Today, Hatton is all right. For him, there is no more pain. For him, there is no more weeping. For him, there is no more death. For all these things have passed away. And therefore we grieve for Hatton, not as those who have no hope, 
for Hatton loved and he was loved. And as we reach out this evening and touch each other in love and in the name of Christ, let us recognize that Hatton has reached out and touched the hand of God. And that one day, each and every one of us in this building will have to do that as well. Until then, let us cling to the words of Jesus the Christ who said, in this life you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. To those who mourn Hatton's loss, to his wife Beverly, to his brothers and sisters and members of his family, I want to extend my condolences and the condolences of this parish with which I associate. And we pray together that rest eternal may be granted unto him. And that light perpetual may forever shine upon him. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. I told you. Let us now sing the hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Father in heaven, you gave your son Jesus Christ to suffering and to death on the cross, and you raised him to life in glory. Grant us a patient faith in times of difficulty, and strengthen our hearts with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Remember, o Lord, this your servant Hatton, who has gone before us with the sign of faith, and now rests in the sleep of peace. According to your promises, grant to him and to all who rest in Christ refreshment, light, and peace. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn. How great thou art.
we move, I must tell you that we are seeking to replace this instrument behind me. It is on its last legs and you need to save the organist from working so hard because he's struggling with it to keep it alive. So as you're leaving the church, there's a collection box at the door. And as you pass it, don't just bow at it. Drop something in it, ever so small, it will help, okay? Don't feel uncomfortable though, because you don't have to. I just want to make you aware so that when you pass it, you will notice it. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.